네, 감사합니다. 어, 우리 영어로 얘기해야 되죠? 예. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so, this is um, my pleasure, of course, as a um, professor who said, this place is something special to me. I spend a long and long time here in this building, some room, <laughs> so at some room, and, and I learned a lot here, and I enjoyed a lot. As you, as, um, exactly as you, I did other things than studying here. So, um, and those things I learned here became sort of base of my recent work. And I'm happy to give a talk about my recent work based on these things. So, as in the title, I'm going to talk about notch in dimension three and topology of four dimensional manifolds. So I think in KAIST, notch are something familiar because of some experts in this department. Some of them, some of them has actually email address. <laughs> yeah. Intel not at KAIST. I still remember that. So, okay, so I'm roughly speaking, oh, before I'm starting, can you everybody hear me? Is it okay? Okay. So, NAT theory is basically the study of embeddings of manifolds. So, basically, we fix two manifolds, M and N, and study how we can embed one guy, M, here into N. Okay? So, here is an Standard example, so a classical knot is an embedding of a one-dimensional circle into the three-dimensional sphere. The three-dimensional sphere is just R3 union, one more point, so it's easy to visualize. This is an example of a classical knot, or we can also think about more than two, more than one component. In this example, I have one circle, second circle, so such a thing is called a link. Okay. So, as a mathematician, a natural question to ask is whether two knots are the same or not. So we need some kind of equivalence relation to identify or distinguish two knots. Namely, when are two knots equal? Obviously, we want to allow, allow some deformation of knots. Okay? Even though, even when you try to draw a given knot, if you are drunken too much, then your picture will be a little bit different. But we want to identify these two knots, basically. That's what we usually do in topology, continuous deformation. So, for instance, here is a knot. And then, well, definitely we want to identify this with this, right? A sim simple deformation moving this part gives us this, okay? Then furthermore, I can get this by deforming this. Could you see? I move this part further to the, <coughs> in this way. Do you see? So I, I want to identify this with this and then this, okay? So probably now it's not difficult to do some further deformation to get this kind of familiar picture, your shoelace, how to tie your shoelace, okay? So these two are exa an example of equivalent knots. This kind of deformation is usually called isotopy. This is essentially deformation in dimension three. We think of knots in dimension three, and here the deformation is done in dimension three. So, in other words, this is not the topic I want to talk about today. In the title, I mentioned topology in dimension four. So, today I want to focus on some different kind of deformation of knots in dimension four. So, so that's something called concordance, which was 
first introduced by Fox and Milner. So the objects are again notch in S3, three-dimensional space. So here is my knot in S3. And I think of the four-dimensional space, S3 cross in unit interval. Okay? And then I want to push this into the four-dimensional space to deform this. So probably this is kind of deformation, right? So, so pushing this, this given knot into the four-dimensional space, I can deform it, but the rule of this game I use here is that if you pass, if the knot passes through a point in the four-dimensional space, then after then, it's not allowed to pass the same point again. Okay? So then the trace of this deformation is, must be something like an embedded cylinder. Okay? This circle times unit interval representing the deformation time parameter. So as a result, I, I deform this into this new knot in the um, S3 cross 1, and the trace of deformation is an embedded cylinder in the four-dimensional space. Sometimes we think of smooth cell manifolds, and sometimes we think of topologically locally flat manifolds. But essentially, it says that just uh, it, it must be locally flat. So in smooth case, that's automatically satisfied. So I want to think of this kind of deformation of a knot in three-dimensional space inside four-dimensional space. Okay? And when I have two such knots, I say that these two knots are concordant by definition. Okay? And I say that a knot or link is lies if it is concordant to the trivial one. What is a trivial knot? That is just a standard circle in my R3. Okay? So if my knot is slice, then this guy is that trivial knot, and so I can think of a disk bounding, disk bounded by this knot, and then attaching that disk to this cylinder, I get now a two-dimensional disk inside the four-dimensional space, so it's called slice. So basically, the main problem is to classify embeddings. Actually, we can think of this kind of concordance equivalence relation for general manifold embeddings, not only for notch and links. And for those things, we want to classify embeddings, in particular notch and links, up to this equivalence relation, namely concordance. So let me tell you that this, this um, deformation in dimension four is very different from ordinary deformation in dimension three by illustrating an example. Okay? I hope this is entertaining. So let's see. Here is my link. Two components, blue and red, in S3 cross zero. So it's when time parameter is zero. What I want to do is the following. Here, because this is in dimension four, it's hard to see. Actually, even in dimension three, sometimes the, something like a surface in dimension three is hard to see as you did in um, freshman calculus. Then what, what do you do to understand the shape of the surface? You take some level set, right? Okay, so we, we take a slice and then this, look at the intersection and move, and then move the slice, the, the level of the slice to stack these level curves. I want to do the same thing for this guy. Namely, I want to think of S3 cross some time parameter T where t is between 0 and 1, okay? So in the next page, I want to, I, I'm going to illustrate that kind of um, level set by looking at this slice first, and then my not originally given link is this, and then when time is um, one fourth, as time goes on, this part and this part become closer, like this. Okay? But there is no change of uh, topology, so abstractly, I still have two circles, right? So this blue circle remains as a circle, red circle, again, another circle. So, but here, now I just 
deform this part like this. Okay? That is exactly the same as a typical saddle point. Okay? So here I have a saddle point for this blue component, and then I have now two blue circles, one here, another one here. Okay? So topologically, abstractly, the result is something like this. I have two blue circles and one red circle, and those two blue circles are from this original blue circle. Okay? So let's do a little bit more, but now it's not difficult to untie this, this blue circle. Could you see? Just grab this part and move this along this path. Right? Then I get this. Two just unmarried blue circles and red circle is also separated, so I get this. Right? So keeping the number of circles on, the, on each level, I can deform this into this, in the four-dimensional space. Okay? And then, if I do further, because this is trivial, then I can just cap it. Okay? Cap it off. And then the remaining thing is just one blue circle and one red circle, and the trace of this deformation is abstractly like this picture. Okay? And then look at this blue part that's a little bit ugly shaped, but it's still a cylinder. It's homeomorphic to a cylinder, and red one, obviously, that's a cylinder, so this is a concordance. In other words, in four dimensional space, I can deform this link into this although it's impossible to tra transform this into this in dimension 3. So this four-dimensional theory is very different from three-dimensional theory. Okay? So this is kind of movie picture. <laughs> okay? As time goes on, I have frames like that. And if I can draw more pictures, then probably I can just put it put this into a frame, frames to get a video clip, but I couldn't, okay? <laughs> so I think, I, I hope this is enough. Okay? So some, why, why is that then interesting to think about this kind of four-dimensional deformation of knots and links? There are many reasons, and, um, you know, what is some interesting mathematics? Well, we have, in some sense, we have a sort of feeling of similar to art. If the theory is beautiful and elegant, then that's a good mathematics. Okay? Actually, I think this, the study of these knots and links up to concordance is something like that, but this is also closely related to some very important problems in topology. So I want to tell you a few. So first of all, one of the I say in geometry, in recent study of geometric topology, one of the most important problems is, I would say, smooth four-dimensional Poincaré conjecture. Three-dimensional Poincaré conjecture done by Perelman, as you know. But in dimension four, and in, in case of differentiable manifolds, it's still open. Namely, if I have a closed four manifold with trivial um, homotopy groups, then is it diffeomorphic to the full sphere. That's a big problem. Everybody wants to solve this. Interestingly, if I can show certain knots or links, actually certain means that I don't want to describe it in detail, but if I can show that, if somebody can show that some, some complicated knot or link is not slice, namely not concordant to the trivial one, then one might show that the smooth four-dimensional Poincaré conjecture is false. Namely, there is a counterexample. Actually, recently, there was an attempt to, to do this by several people, but unfortunately, their examples were not good for this purpose. So it's just an ongoing story. But there, I, still, there, is, there are some potential counterexamples for which this kind of approach could be useful. Okay? And second, the second one I want to mention is the classification problem for topological four manifolds. Main machinery of classification of manifolds 
is, of course, surgery theory. Surgery is just something like cutting your manifold and gluing it back in some different way. We are more creative than actual surgeon so that we glue it back in some different way to get something different. Okay? So that's surgery and we, in higher dimensions, surgery gives us a nice classification of manifolds within a fixed homotopy type. And in dimension four, it's not yet known whether this kind of technique, namely surgery, works. So a famous result of Friedman says that surgery technique works for topological four manifolds if the fundamental group is nice. It's actually called good in their paper. Okay? So good means, in other words, that surgery works. And it's known that, for instance, sub-exponential groups are good, namely for those fundamental groups, surgery technique can be used to classify topological four manifolds. And so the natural question is whether all groups are good or not. If every group is good in this sense, then we can apply surgery to classify topological four manifolds. And again, interestingly, it is known that all groups are good if and only if certain class of links are all slice links. Namely, the problem of classifying topological four manifolds is, can be translated into a link concordance problem. Okay? So if I can understand link concordance completely, then probably, probably not me, somebody <laughs> can just prove that surgery works or surgery doesn't work. Well, that's a good question, and I asked the same question to several experts, but they hesitate to give an answer, so I guess <laughs> it's not yet, well, there is no common sense. But probably whether surgery works or not for topological full manifolds, for any fundamental group. Yeah. Probably, I guess, I think many people think that the answer would be no, namely it doesn't work. But there is no evidence yet, so. Same question to the, to the second one. I mean, you know, like, do you actually expect this knot to be unslice in this format, in this Pankai uh -huh. So the, the, the current, recent attempts were to sh find a counter example. It was recent attempts were along that direction. Like a big, you know, uh, amount of candidates, so you, you feel like it must be one or something, or not likely. Well, interestingly, you know, they, somebody, Friedman and others, you know, tried some potential counterexamples, guessing that they are actually counterexamples, but after they posted the paper on the internet, after three days, Selman Akubut showed that they are actually not counterexamples. So still, uh, to that direction and just turn to the other direction, not clear yet, I think, yeah. So, okay, so for instance, this is one of the links in the collection mentioned here. Namely, if one, the question for this link is whether this is topologically sliced or not, namely whether it can be deformed in dimension four into a trivial link. If it is not sliced, then not all groups are good. Okay? That is, Friedman's topological surgery machinery doesn't work in general for arbitrary fundamental groups. So this is kind of pretty simple and explicit example, but we don't know still yet whether this is life or not. Okay. Yeah, that's the same as not. Namely, you deform the link in the four-dimensional space I'm um, using disjoint cylinders embedded in the full space. And then the result is, should be a trivial link. That's the definition of a slice link, okay? So, we use, in the study of concordance of natural links, we use several kinds of tools related to other areas of mathematics. 
first, we use obviously three manifold theory because our object shall in dimension three. We use four dimension, four dimensional topology, four manifold theory because we work with deformation in dimension four. And surgery theory, we want to modify manifolds to get the slicing disk or something like that. And homotopy theory often gives us very useful and important invariants. And also we use K theory and L theory to get invariants of not links up to concordance. Also we use Athea type index theory. And in case of smooth category, we use several other things. For instance, recent development of flow homology gives us nice, very really wonderful information about not concordance of not chain links and gauge theory has been used and quantum invariants like polyno Jones polynomial and their categorification like Kovanov homology gives us in information, new information on not concordance and link concordance. And well, interestingly, some analysis is also used recently. So as a part of today's talk, I'm going to tell you something about the use of operator algebra, functional analysis to study concordance. And also we have our old good friend algebra. So we, we often use even non-commutative rings and modules over non-commutative rings. And algebraic number theory often gives us nice invariants. And because we are very interested in how to deal with fundamental groups, group theory plays a key role in the study. So today, I want to tell you something about the use of three-manifold three theory, four-manifold theory, surgery theory, and index theory, and some analysis. That's what I want to focus on today, okay? So let me, next, let me introduce you some kind of idea to modify this problem on not chain links, namely problem on embeddings into problem on manifolds. The trick is simple. So if, if I have such a concordance between two knots or links, then I can, first of all, I can do surgery along C or more simply, I can just remove one small absolute neighborhood of this concordance. Then what I get is now just manifold. If I do one of these, then I get three manifolds from this knot, two, three manifolds, and a concordance gives us this four manifold, and it turns out that it has a nice homological property, namely they obtain the four manifold W is bounded by those associated three manifolds, as illustrated in this picture, and it turns out that they have the same homology groups. Okay? So this kind of manifold W is called a homology cobaltism between those given three manifolds. And so because of this operation, we can translate often the study of notch modulo the equivalence relation of concordance into the study of three manifolds modulo homology cobaltism. Actually, this is sort of a function. Okay? well-defined function. And so by pulling back any invariant under homology cobaltism, I can get invariant under concordance. So studying this equivalence relation between three manifolds is important for our purpose. So based on Atia type index theory, there are several useful invariants for concordance and homology cobaltism. So let me tell you basic idea about that. So given a closed three manifold and given a homomorphism of the fundamental group into a group, let's just suppose that there is a nice four manifold W which is bounded by M. M is my three manifold and W has boundary M. And suppose that my given homomorphism extends to the fundamental group of this four manifold. Namely, I have such a commutative diagram. I guess it's not easy to see my point now, right? <laughs> Can you? Shall I use something else? No. Probably, yeah. 
I'm not tall enough, but I, I think I can try. Yes, so, so, okay, so this is the given setup. And then it turns out that if we look at some twisted Poincare duality of this four manifold W, then sometimes if we have a nice uh, theatide index theorem, then we sometimes can get some invariant of this three manifold from that four manifold. So we are interested in the three manifold, but the, we have a choice, namely the choice of the four manifold, but the result can be shown sometimes to be an invariant, which is irrelevant to the choice of W using Atiyah's index theorem, Atiyah type index theorem. Of course, there are several technical necessary conditions, so I said, I would say, in addition, we should be lucky to get such an invariant. So those kind of invariants include those of Atiyah Singer, that's the so-called G signature, and Cass and Golden did something like that, and for when the group is a unitary group, that's this is then this homomorphism is not more than a unitary representation, and at the part of the singer defines some signature invariant along these lines. And for any group G, using some analysis starting from Athea, Athea and Chigo Gromov, and after then Chang Weinberger gave us some more useful invariants which can be applied to a larger class of groups. So let me just tell you briefly what is a twisted duality of four manifolds. So the given data in the previous page is a four manifold and a homomorphism. And then Poincare duality is actually basically not more than the intersection form. What is the intersection? In, in dimension four, if I have two two-dimensional let's say four manifolds, then because two plus two is four, the intersection of those two two-dimensional four manifolds consists of points in general. That's the general, the general case. And we count the number of those intersection points with some naturally assigned signs using orientation, then that gives us sort of bilinear form. And when we have such a um, representation, we can think of for the um, twisted coefficient homology, and that gives us more information in terms of intersection form like this. Then if, for instance, if the manifold is compact and if the group is finite, then everything here is finite dimensional even over C, because G is finite, then we can use complex dimension because the complex dimension is always finite for finitely generated complex vector space. And then this can be used to define certain numerical invariants as done by Atia Singer and Atia Patodi Singer. So, oh, thank you. 감사하다고 그냥 하면 되는데요, 그죠? 어, 헷갈리고 있어. 그러면, 이걸로 해도 넘어가나요? 이건 안 넘어가네? 불은 좀 나요? 마찬가지인가? 아, 이걸로 그러면 제주 것 해볼게요, 양손으로. 네. Okay, so, so for example, a familiar spectral theorem, which, is, which means that you can diagonalize commission matrices, says that when I have such an intersection form, I can decompose the underlying homology into three parts, positive definite part, negative definite part, and zero part. That's not more than standard diagonalization. And then the G signature of Atia singular is defined to be a dimension of positive definite part and dimension of negative definite part. This is so-called a G signature of Atia and singular. And this often gives us information on not concordance and link concordance. But when G is an infinite group, complex dimension is in general infinite. So inf in general, infinite minus infinite has no meaning. So that's not good for us. So that's why we use some more analytic construction 
to define a better notion of dimension for our purpose. So let me tell you then about some analysis from now on. So in general, I just think of any discrete countable group, okay? In topology, manifolds, manifolds consist of always countable, any manifold that's um, countable fundamental group, and so it's, it's good for us. It's enough, it's not a severe restriction. So given such a group, I think of an associated Hilbert space. Here, I, this is just a um, formal linear combination over complex coefficients. GG is a complex number. But these coefficients are chosen in such a way that they are square summable. Okay? So this is not more than the Hilbert space generated by the group elements as a basis. Okay? So those group elements G plays a role of orthogonal basis for this Hilbert space. And the inner product is defined in an obvious way. And then I think of the ring, algebra of bounded linear operators on this Hilbert space, the analytic object. This is an operator algebra. And then the famous group von Neumann algebra is defined as follows. This is the group von Neumann algebra NG here. is a subalgebra of this operator algebra consisting of operators A, which commit with, commit with um, right action of the group elements. Okay? So in other words, the action of this operator is comparable with group, group operation, group multiplication operation. Okay? It turns out that this is, this has nice properties. So first of all, this is a, an algebra, in particular it's a ring, and this contains the complex group ring. No, what is C of G group ring? There is just a set of ring of finite formal linear combinations of group elements. So this is contained in the group von Neumann algebra. And so this is kind of an analytic enlargement of the group ring, which is an algebraic object. So what are these advantages? First, there is a spectral theorem for elements in this guy. Namely, we can do functional calculus. In other words, we can, even for those guys, we can diagonalize things, even when the dimension is infinite, namely when G is an infinite group. Okay? Furthermore, other than the complex dimension, there is another very nice dimension theory, which is usually referred to as L2 dimension theory. That is, that can be viewed as a function assigning a non-negative real number. Here the dimension can be a real number. Dimension can be something like 1.5 or square root, square root 2 or even pi. Actually, whether the dimension associated to some topological object can be um, irrational is a big conjecture. So. I would just stay within things like 1 over 2 or <laughs> rational numbers. But anyway, in general, it's real value dimension. And whenever I have a finitely generated module over this ring for Neumann group algebra, then the dimension is finite real number, non-negative finite real number. So um, I want to tell you why what kind of nice analytic properties enables us to define, obtain such a nice dimension function. So the dimension theory was formulated by Wolfgang Loeb in the following way. First of all, there is a classical um, von Neumann trace defined for operators in the von Neumann algebra. So the formula is not important for our purpose today, but the point is just that we have something like trace function. Remember, recall that a more there is a more complicated way to define the dimension of a subspace of, let's say, Rn. When I have a subspace of Rn, then there is a projection onto that subspace, right? And then compute the trace of that projection. A trace, 
projection is just a square matrix, right? From Rn to Rn, then that's a just a matrix. Projection is a just matrix, and then take the trace of that matrix. Then what is that? That's exactly the dimension of the given subspace, right? So whenever we have a trace, there might be a chance to define dimension in that way. Actually, it works in this case. So I need to choose a projection, but in general, there is no projection onto a given module. Which modules are good? Projective modules are good. Projective modules are actually those associated to projections of a free module. That's another way to define projective module. So for projective module, P, it's a, it's a part of the free module, and then we can choose a projection and just take a matrix representing the projection and then take now a von Neumann trace instead of the ordinary complex tra trace. Then it gives us something like a dimension. So we define it to be the dimension of the given projective module. So we, we are good. That the situation is nice for projective case. But we want to deal with general case arbitrarily given module. In that case, the idea is to use projective modules to approximate the size, namely the dimension of the arbitrarily given module. So we th think of finitely generated projective star modules inside lying inside the given module, let's say M, then take the supremum. Okay, that's a naive approach, but the p okay. What is e? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's just identity in the group. Oh. Okay, so 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 the nice real re, the the actual nice thing of this approach is that the re resulting function behaves. Okay, no problem, no problem. So E is supposed to be a function. Oh, no. E is an element in the Hilbert space. Right, Hilbert space. So okay. A is a operator, and so we apply operator to the Hilbert space element E. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just Hilbert space of R2 function on G. I'm sorry? So, so that means function on G, right? Probably, I think it's good to go back then to answer to your question. So, so, my Hilbert space is this, which contains the grouping. So grouping actually contained in two places, this and this. So that E appeared in the, 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 the definition of von Neumann trace is E inside this guy. Okay, so that's the alpha function. Anyway. Oh, you, you want to compare it with? <laughs> no, I think it's as a function on group G, then it's equal to one. Identity element equals zero other places, right? Or well, it's, I mean, it depends. For G, what is CG for, for E? What is GE is one, right? All other coefficients are zero. That's what I mean. Yeah, okay. Function, yeah. Function. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. You're, you're looking at the coefficients as a function. Right. That's exactly that. Okay. So, okay. I, I think, okay. This, that's. So the nice thing about this resulting function is that it actually behaves like dimension. In other words, it deserves. For instance, when I, when I have such a strode exact sequence, I have the expected equality. This is not, not obvious at all because I used projective modules to estimate the size, the dimension. So in other words, in order to have such a nicely behaving dimension function, I, have, I must have enough projective modules. These projective modules are something like a mesh in numerical analysis. Okay? The mesh size must be smaller to get a nice approximation. So I need many, many projective modules, and actually that's true. There are sufficiently many, in some sense, sufficiently many projective modules over von Neumann group algebra because of some very easy analytic reason. Namely, whenever I have a subspace in the Hilbert space, I can take the closure and then there is a projection. And the closure is very close to the subspace. So whatever I have, I have 
this is a kind of more reason that this kind of approximation by projective modules is nice. Okay. okay. Then using this L2 dimension, we can define Chigogromf invariant. So given a duality intersection form namely of on the homology of four manifold with now we use von Neumann group algebra as homology coefficients other rather than the ordinary algebraic grouping. And then it turns out that we can define the signature, which is usually called L2 signature of that intersection form, which is now real valued using L2 dimension instead of the complex dimension. So we just take the spectral decomposition to get the positive definite part and negative definite part and then take the L2 dimension. The, it, the resulting one is usually referred to as a Chigogron flow invariant. Actually, they use originally some um, a elliptic operator approach to define this without using the four manifold, but it turns out that this kind of Hilchbrook type approach gives us the same invariant for the three manifold, which is the boundary of the four manifold. So this is the invariant I want to think about mainly today. So uh, regarding our purpose to study concordance of notch and links, the main question would be the following. So translating the concordance problem into homology cobaltism, let's think about a given homology cobaltism like this. And suppose that I have a representation into a group, given group gamma. So everything is mapped to, into this fixed group gamma. Then question is for which groups gamma? Those um, are these associated Chigogromf invariants the same? So uh, previously you were talking about W being kind of boundary or not? Boundary, having boundary. In any case, we can define. Yeah, to define an invariant of three manifolds. No, no, I mean, with the previous slide, you were, you're talking talk about all those L2, sigma, whatever. So yeah, that's, that can be done for any four manifold. So you didn't, you, you, you don't mind have boundary. That's yeah, actually, the, the index theorem says that when it has no boundary, the twisted signature is the same as the ordinary signature. That's, oh, okay. that's the index theory. So in that case, it's not interesting. I see. Yeah. I see because they, they proved it. Okay. It was interesting to them, but for us. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so, so the, the question stated here is the invariance of this Chigogromf invariant. And previously, it was known for some very special case of group schema, which is called polytorsion free abelian. I don't want to tell you. Uh, precise definition of this, but this is a special kind of torsion free groups, namely there is no finite order elements in this group, in such a group. So, so a recent result of mine joined with Kent Orr at Indiana University regarding the question, the previous question is the following. First, let me just define an amenable group. A group is called amenable if there is a finitely additive invariant measure on the group. So in other words, we have a natural way to measure the size of a subset of a group, okay, roughly. And I need an algebraic condition, which is called the Strabus class DR, that involves some projective modules and and injectivity, so, but let me just skip the details, technical details. Then for any, and let me assume that R is, this R is always a finite cyclic ring or a sovereign of the rationals. Then the main theorem of myself and Kent Orr is the following. The Chigogromf invariants are actually preserved under homology cobaltism when this concerned group, coefficient group is amenable and in the stable class. So this gives us, for those groups, this gives us invariance under homology cobaltism and so invariance under not concordance and link concordance. So 
what's an amenable group? It's a long story, but let me just tell you a very simple introduction to the very original motivation of an amen the study of an amenable group. There is a very famous sort of paradox. Actually, it's a theorem, but because its conclusion is very un unexpected, it's usually called a paradox due to Banach and Tarski. The, the, their theorem is the following. Suppose that I have two bounded subsets with non-empty interior in the Euclidean space. Okay? For instance, my A can be, my A can be just this small ball and my B can be this large ball. Okay? Whatever A and B, I can decompose A into finitely many parts and then apply some rigid motion, namely Euclidean isometry, to each piece so that they can be assembled again. Then the result, I can arrange these things so that the result is exactly the same as B without any overlap. It's amazing, isn't it? Even when the volumes are different, we can do that. So that's a kind of paradox, intuitively at least. This is the unexpected result. And actually when the dimension is low, this doesn't hold. Namely, it's impossible to arrange this kind of decomposition of arbitrarily given A and B. Uh, Another the f f a subsequent amazing result of von Neumann is the following. This kind of paradox, named banach tarski paradox, never appears if and only if the associated isometry group is amenable. Yeah, something like that. We can we can think of a much more general setup than this RN case. Any kind of geometric setup. Okay. So, so recall that the definition of amenable group involves some existence of nice measure. Okay. In that case, because of that measure, we cannot do this kind of weird thing. Okay. Oops. Okay. So this is the original motivation of the study of amenable groups, but very interestingly, amenable groups are now used in the study of natural links. As and in the use of this kind of analysis, I want to explain a little bit more about the involved analysis. So previously there are previously known special cases that gives us an affirmative answer to our main question stated before, namely for so-called polytorsion-free abelian groups, we have some invariance of Chigogram-Gramf invariance due to Cochrane or Teichner. And but in their case, in the in this special case, the arguments are all essentially algebraic, even though we use the von Neumann group algebra. Actually, they they don't use any analytic property of the von Neumann group algebra, but they use some algebra effect, namely, when this group is so special, the group ring, ordinary algebraic group ring, has a quotient field. You know that any domain has quotient field, but that's when the ring is commutative. So in the case of non-commutative rings, it's so-called ori localization, and there is a necessary and sufficient condition, which is very classical, which guarantees the existence of now skew quotient field, and they use the existence of skew quotient field. You know, fields are much easier to use than <laughs> rings. And so they made the use of the advantage of this nice algebraic structure to show the invariance of Chigogram invariant. But in our, in this kind of algebraic method is very limited. For instance, when my group has finite order elements, namely torsion, the group ring is even not a domain. There are, there are zero divisors. This is the famous <laughs> decomposition of 
g to the rth minus 1, right? So this times this is 0, so that's not a domain. Our analytic method can be applied even when g has torsion. Okay? So that's how we made the use of the amenability as well as the algebraic properties stated as Strabus class. Because of the lack of time, I think that's what I can say about some underlying moral ideas of my main theorem. The collection of the groups we are interested in, namely amenable groups in Strabus class, is very large. It contains all the previously known cases of useful groups, and it also contains a lot of new cases. It contains many infinite groups with finite other elements. As I said in the previous slide, when the group has told you on the previous algebraic techniques, doesn't work, but we can actually use groups with torsion. So there are some, we made some applications of our main theorem of invariant, Chigogromf invariant. So they, the applications include, for instance, this is something in higher dimension, something about higher dimensional manifold theory, namely using our invariant associated to torsion elements, we produced actually infinitely many high dimensional manifolds which have the same homotopy type, namely they are homotopy equivalent. But they are not homology covalent. So, so this manifold has no boundary. Right. Right. And we use the bounding 4K dimensional manifold to define those signature invariants. You're right. And we also obtained some similar research about homology cobaltism of special cases of three manifolds called um, spherical space forms. And those three manifolds has usually um, finite order elements in their fundamental groups. And so the previously known techniques doesn't work for those, but we could detect a lot of interesting situations. And we, can, we also have some applications of notch in general theory manifolds rather than our Euclidean space or S3. Okay, so in order to um, tell you uh, another application to not theory of our Chigogromf invariant result, I want to introduce you so-called Whitney trig and Whitney towers which plays a key role in four-dimensional topology. So, surgery theoretic classification of manifolds is very successful in higher dimension and a key step of, of that is to find the embedded spheres. Namely, here is my manifold M and I want to modify it by doing surgery. To do surgery, I need some frame, right? I want to cut off my, oh, that's not a good example, but so, I want to cut the, my, the blackboard, then I need a frame, right, to cut it, cut it out. So in topology, we usually use embedded spheres inside this, this manifold, and then we cut off, cut off this manifold along this embedded sphere and, and glue it back in some different way to obtain a new manifold, and usually in the result, this embedded case sphere becomes no homotopic in the result. That's what we usually do by doing surgery. Namely, we kill homotopy clashes. But the point is that I need an embedded sphere. If it's not embedded, then it's much more complicated to cut and glue, glue something back. So but in many cases, unfortunately, we only have immersed spheres like this. So there are some self intersections. So when you have self-intersections, the standard technique to remove self-intersection points is called the Whitney tree. So the idea is pretty simple. For instance, it's three-dimensional space, and then inside the three-dimensional space, as an example, I have two-dimensional object and one-dimensional object, which intersect, right? I want to remove those two intersection points. And then the trick is to find such a disk, purple disk, 
which is usually called written disk. When I have such a disk, it's easy to deform this two-dimensional object as I illustrated here. Could you see? I just push, push this arc, this purple arc, a half boundary of the disk. Okay? And then I have no, no the, these intersections are removed in this picture. Okay? This is called the Whitney trick, and it turns out that algebraic topological conditions guarantees the existence of Whitney disk, but in general it's immersed. But the point is that a Whitney disk is always two-dimensional. If you have, let's say, a hundred-dimensional manifold, then if you have two two-dimensional objects, then they won't meet in general. So that's why in higher dimension, we can use surgery theory to classify manifolds. So if the dimension is large, then we can modify an immersed within disk into an embedded within disk just by taking a general position. Okay? So that's good for higher dimension, but in dimension four, now, I have a two-dimensional Whitney disk, so 2 plus 2 is again 4, and so it's often, in general, it's impossible to remove self-intersections. Self That's the difficulty in dimension 4. And so an attempt is to iterate this. So here is my, let's say, a given immersed two sphere, C0 with intersection, self-intersection points. Then I want to find a Whitney disk to remove those two intersections, as I did before. But the Whitney disk itself has, may have self-intersections. So this C1 Whitney disk candidate has self-intersections. OK, then let's just do that again. I want to remove those intersections. So I have now the next level Whitney disk. But it's still immersed. Then let's just repeat. Okay? How many times can I do that? So actually, this kind of idea is organized as follows. A Whitney tower of height n is such a collection of disks with immersed Whitney disks up to height n in a four manifold. And often we define height n.5 Whitney tower, which is kind of between n and n plus 1, and here. Here, I, I think of n plus 1 level, but that level is allowed to meet the previous level. Okay? So that's a little bit technical, but it's just something between n and n plus 1. Then, this kind of Whitney tower idea apply, is applied to knot theory, knot slicing problem. So what is our goal? We have a given knot and we want to see whether it's a slice knot. Namely, we want to see whether there is a bounding two-dimensional disk embedded in the four-dimensional space to see whether this is slice. Then, if I remove this slice disk, then I get a four manifold. Namely, remove a small neighbor, the epsilon neighbor of the slice disk from the four-dimensional four space. And then, the result is a four manifold whose boundary is actually S3 surged x S3 along this knot because I removed this part. Okay? So, a knot slicing, a, tip, a standard slicing strategy is as follows. First of all, I start with any four manifold whose boundary is as desired. Finding, finding such a four manifold is not terribly complicated. So that's something can be done using just algebraic topology. And then, do surgery on this guy to obtain something like this, namely the complement of slice disk by doing surgery. So I want to do surgery on this W, and for that purpose, as I told you, I need some certain nice embedded two spheres, very roughly speaking, of course. But in dimension four, it's not easy to find the embedded spheres, so, so we may think of, we can think of which towers instead of an Im embedded, honest embedded disk. So this is the really rough version of the definition, or definition. So if there is a Whitney tower of height, let's say H, instead of those desired embedded two spheres, then we call the knot is H solvable. Namely, it means that this knot has 
height h Whitney tower. And the deformation fault we use is called an H, sol H solution. That's not sol solution. So in that, so, oh, so let me just tell you then. Because I do. So actually, previous results on um, not concordance can be understood in terms of Whitney towers. So in the 60s, they, they could detect whether a knot has Whitney tower of height 0 0.5, very low. And in the 70s, Kessen and Gordon successfully detected height 1.5, still very low. And in the 80s, Friedman gave some nice topological slicing techniques. And after then, in the late, late 90s or early 2000s, Kakran or Teichner produced some technique to detect higher height Whitney Towers, existence of higher Whitney Towers. So let me just skip this part. And the final application of our main result I want to tell you now is the following. Our Chigogromf invariant actually gives us new obstructions to being a slice knot. And in addition, it gives us actually an obstruction to have height n.5 Whitney tower for any n using some solvable, solvable group coefficients. So as a special case, our result gives us as a corollary the previous result of Cochran and Teichner. And actually, our new invariant gives us further information about not concordance, which we were unable to see using previous techniques. So this theorem says that. Thank you very much.